welcome to our discussion today on sleep disorders. With me today are Dr. Leonard Suraj, ENT surgeon, and Dr. Jacqueline Bird, pediatrician. Welcome to the Government Information Service. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. having us. Most welcome. So we start out today by looking at your diagnostic sleep center, which was established last year in November. Yeah. Um, can you just, first of all, right off the bat, give us an understanding of why a diagnostic sleep center, first of all, any one of you? Mm -hmm. Well, the idea came in a few years prior to that, so when I was getting so many complaints from people who have sleeping disorders and uh, difficulty falling asleep, those who fall asleep and wake up quickly and can't sleep again, those who get into road traffic accidents because of sleep deprivation. Right. And uh, many of those who had the necessary contacts would have gone overseas to Miami, to Trinidad, to look to do a test to find out how bad their sleeping disorder is and how it can be corrected. And uh, having, and I subsequently attended a course on sleep disorders. And of course, it dwelled on me that really we should be offering a service like this in St. Lucia, because nobody else in the, uh, in the OECS had actually was involved in that. So Dr. Suraj, you, you speak as a specialist in nose and fruit surgeon, yeah, yeah. Um, but Dr. Bird, um, apparently sleep disorders are also a problem for children, the, the, the little people as well. So your perspective and your involvement in the Most definitely. center. And uh, we have, t we, there are two pediatricians associated with the center, Dr. Martin Plummer and myself, and then two physicians, Dr. Leonard Suraj, who is a surgeon, and Dr. Martin Didier, who is an, an internist. Right. Uh, it's well recognized that sleep is one of your most important functions, perhaps as important as eating and drinking. And especially in children, we recognize when sleep deprivation affects children. There are many children with, who have sleep disorders for many problems, for, for many reasons, but the problems manifest a lot in their behavior. So we have children with disordered behavior in classroom settings, uh, hyperactivity, poor attention, restlessness, uh, somnolence. A lot of children fall asleep during a, a, a boring class. Uh, and that's when we recognized that this perhaps was a service that would not only help Dr. Suraj's patients with their mm. airway obstructions and Dr. Didier's patients with their metabolic problems, but children as well. Mm. So in terms of the numbers of persons that you're seeing, and just to paint it in the local context, so the average, on average, how many persons or what percentage of St. Lucians, if you have any statistics on that, would mm -hmm. you say go out elsewhere mm -hmm. to get um, further treatment of, of these sleep Well, orders? what I can say is that about between 10 and 20% of the population, okay. any given population, would have had some sleeping disorders. And sadly enough, of that 20%, only about 5% of that 20 would have actually gotten any redress to the problem. Meaning that a vast majority remain undiagnosed. And even in, in more developed countries like the United States, and most of the figures are coming from there, we have not done any local figures because we are very early, we are fledglings in that profession and uh, so we have not developed data for that but we know that as your society get more affluent and as people get more obese have more weight issue and sleeping disorders then the figure ranges from about from as low as four percent to about 20 percent of people having problems and before we had this sleep test the, those who could afford would have gone overseas and get the treatment and uh, I, I don't want to lose track of that. When we, in the formation of that particular sleep uh, diagnostic sleep center, we looked for uh, expertise that would have been blending with the challenges we would have in sleep studies, and that is pediatrics, a very high proportion of children with adenoid tonsil problem end up having sleep apnea, falling asleep. Um, I noticed so um, with Dr. Didi as a 
in cardiology Inter and right. in turn this as well with the heart and, yeah. and, and these other so things. So the composition yeah. was well thought out to bring in two pediatric, one internal medicine and a head and neck person. Okay. So in the last six months, what have you been doing? Oh, well, before you launch that program, there's a tremendous amount of training from overseas because we have two technicians who have been trained to conduct, to actually do the montages and, and do the, 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 the test itself. So these people have to be trained from overseas and we had for about almost a year, we had overseas experts coming to St. Lucia to conduct the training. So we had been busy doing that kind of thing. And since November, we've been doing tests and uh, seeing patients who have sleeping disorders. Okay. But let's, let's us look at what exactly is a sleep disorder. I, I know it's somewhat associated with breathing and even manifests itself to most of us in, in hearing somebody snore. Mm -hmm. um, there. What exactly is a sleep disorder? Well, the slide shows us the spectrum of sleep disorders ranging from mild occasional snoring all the way up to what we call severe obstructive sleep apnea which is really a death knell for persons who are not um, uh, recognizing that they have a problem. So there's normal breathing and then there's the other end of the spectrum, severe obstructive sleep apnea. And in between, you have mild snoring, regular snoring, and the increasing upper airway obstructions. Now these manifest uh, in patients in a wide variety of ways. Some people may not even recognize that they have this disorder, but they do recognize daytime sleepiness, falling asleep in unusual places, uh, the children, restlessness and hyperactivity. Uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder has been diagnosed in a lot of children, and often it points back to their inadequate sleep at night. So then um, I guess the person who has a sleep order, are they aware that they have it? Or is it that a relative or a parent um, let, gives them the heads up and then in terms of your in interrogation with them, your interaction with them, that is when you discover. How exactly um, do you get to know that somebody has a sleep disorder? Mm. Um, most times the patient or the person may complain of being tired in the morning. It, despite a long sleep, rest well, sleeping at night, okay. they, still, they still feel as though they are tired in the morning. Sometimes they feel that the throat is so dry, the more they drink water, the more dry it is throughout the day. Others may have headaches, and others may know that they are snoring, and some of them would rem recall waking up as if there is something choking them and they wake up and sleep again and, and, and uh, breathe again and fall back asleep. So these are what they would account. But the real evidence comes from their spouse or whoever is watching them yes. and would see a drama that you would only have to see it on video to understand it. So there's snoring mm. and mm. then there's this complete disruption in sleep that is actually very scary to watch, especially mm. in a, on a young child. Some of the milder clues are children take up odd sleeping positions. So if you have a baby who will not sleep well unless the head is extended over the edge of the bed so that the neck is extended, that's a very good clue. Mm. If you have children that sit bolt upright after an hour of sleeping and look around as if frightened, children that have other displays of night terrors, children that have started wetting their bed again when they used to be dry at night, that's called secondary bedwetting. Those are some of the clues other than the daytime sleepiness and the failure to, to be easily roused when it's time to get up in mm -hmm. children. That's right. And uh, of course, in adults, there is a, a tremendous amount of accidents that have been documented by patients who fall asleep. And for example, why would a 20, 25, 30 year old person male, sleeping all night, goes, drive from Beaufort to Castries, and halfway falls asleep. Yeah. And uh, if you happen to be somebody who is have the lives of other people in your hands, say you were a public bus driver, you were, 
you have is not only you and your vehicle, you have passengers, and therefore it it calls for understanding that if you do have a sleeping deficit, to actually address it. I'm big on statistics, but in in terms of the numbers of accidents reported or. Mm -hmm. um, you know that 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 get referred to you get referred to the um, public hospitals. Um, do you gather any statistics on it? Um, no, uh, the statistics may be gotten mostly from the traffic department. Right. And then, of course, if you really have to look at the information, they would ask you, "Have the person been convicted of that?" So it gets very hazy if you are looking purely at uh, diagnosing whoever had. Um, uh, sleep disorders. Now that we have the sleep lab, I think we're going yeah. to be able to be able to shed some light on that. Yeah. Uh, now that we are beginning to diagnose people and their sleep problems, mm -hmm. but you know, there's there's evidence for sleep disturbance as well in doctors' offices looking after adults, especially with metabolic problems. But we haven't yet begun to make that connection. Mm -hmm. Not sleeping properly adversely affects management of high blood pressure, diabetes, yeah. weight control. There is a, a, a definite link between disordered sleep and its associated lack of oxygen and your ability to control your weight gain mm. in your efforts. Uh, so people need to start paying attention and recognizing that if you're diabetic and you can't really understand why it's becoming so difficult to control your diabetes or your hypertension or mm. your heart disease, the link may be poor sleep. This is very serious because it sounds like it's more than just a nuisance of somebody snoring. Absolutely. Um, but there are some very serious Secondary health, mm. health consequences. And indicators as well. Mm. Um, what causes this then? The sleeping disorders are caused by many, many things. For one thing, uh, your size, your weight for height can be an issue. The size of your neck can be an issue because when you store fat, usually you store it all over your body, but the neck is particularly prone to cause problem because as the neck expands, it narrows the inside passage for breathing. <clears throat> and also strange enough, experiments have shown that when you store weight, you store fat, you also store it in the tongue. So the tongue gets big and fat. And therefore, if you're lying on your back, the tongue falls back. Also, as you age, the muscle tone is reduced. And as a result, it causes the pharyngeal muscle, the upper throat muscle, that's relaxed to make the, the, the throat blocked and, and the tongue falls back. Also, you have people whose chin is shorter. And as a result, the tongue is further back and causes that, cause, also causes the obstruction. And of course, people may have nasal problem. As an ENT person, I remember that one first. The <laughs> nasal issue, bent nose, swell, swollen sinus issues, so that as soon as they fall asleep, the natural thing is that your, the air will pass through the path of least resistance. So the nose have too much resistance, so the mouth just open and you breathe through your mouth, hmm. and you dry up your throat and you start snoring. But uh, while on that, I want to say that snoring itself is not the culprit as much as it is the forerunner to other things. The flag, the red the flag. flag. red flag. Mm -hmm. So, because if I am snoring, then it is somebody who is listening to me that I have the problem. <laughs> because, <laughs> indeed, because, indeed. Mm, but uh, the, it's a spectrum of problem from snoring to mild obstruction, moderate obstruction, severe obstruction, and when the breathing cuts off completely, you get apnea. But um, smoking would contribute to that as well? Unless it's associated with some allergy. Hardly smoking is an issue. Smoking has other health problem, okay. but not tremendously related to sleep apnea. What about drinking? Drinking, yes, because with drinking comes the, apart from you being more sedated after drinking, your muscles are more relaxed, and therefore you're more likely to, to have snoring. More importantly, because you sleep so heavy, you tend to sleep in one position for longer. 
because you because your muscles are more relaxed and you are uptonded. So as a result, you do not turn and switch position because sleep is very dynamic. You don't stay in one place like a log. You keep on turning all the time. And uh, when you are alcoholic, uh, alcoholically infused, <laughs> then <laughs> then you do not um, res you do not change position and you tend to snore more. In, in the children, enlarged tonsils and adenoids are a fact of life, Big, in, yeah. in, especially in very young children, because the, the tonsils and adenoids are the tissues that respond to external allergies. Uh, so they're usually larger than average in many children, and those are frequently the cause of unobstructed airway and mm. the cause of obstructive sleep apnea. And mm. removing the tonsils, tonsils and adenoids are often uh, is often Remedies. curative. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. While on the children's side, I just want to add one thing, and that is sleep is extremely important for children's growth. Because if you, as we go further in the program, we may get into the stages of sleep, stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, in terms of depth of sleep. And the children must achieve a certain amount of depth of sleep. If they are missing that because of adenoid and, 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 and tonsil enlargement and sleep apnea, you find that their growth is stunted. It's dramatic after you move the tonsil and adenoid. They just start growing like magic. Okay. Very interesting conversation with Dr. Jacqueline Bird and Dr. Leonard Suraj on sleep disorders. We'll be back in a moment to continue the conversation. When you're out at sea, there are no service stations along the way or supermarkets for a quick stop if you need something. It is essential that everything you will need while at sea is on the boat before you leave. That's why pre-sea checks are so important. Checks should be carried out by more than one person to ensure that all essentials are on board. Everything on board? Yeah, everything here. Yeah. Let's go to the airport car with that, boy. Free sea checks should include food stores, extra water and fuel, navigational equipment, safety gear, and communication yep. equipment. Okay, light out, sir. Before heading out to sea, always ensure that all equipment is in working order. You are stocked up on food and also extra fuel. Call the lighthouse to inform them of your voyage plan and inform someone responsible of your departure time and estimated time of arrival back on shore. For more information on obtaining a license to fish, contact the Department of Fisheries at 468-4143. Welcome back. Today we're discussing sleeping disorders and in studio I have with me from the Diagnostic Sleep Center, Dr. Leonard Suraj and Dr. Jacqueline Bird. So we were discussing what are sleep, orders, sleep disorders mm -hmm. and some of the causes. Um, so right now we will move into some of the other effects of them. Um, what would you say um, are some of the effects actually of those sleep orders? Okay, <clears throat> for one thing, the lack of sleep causes initially hyperactivity. It Especially of children. Yeah, of children. Okay. And uh, it causes, in adults, it causes a lack, it, apart from wanting to sleep at maybe critical times when you have operating a machinery, whether it is a vehicle or whether it is a, a power tool that you're operating, there's a chance that you, know, you may just fall asleep. Also, from a medical point of view, a lack of uh, sleep leads to high blood pressure, diabetes, heart failure, and people who are untreated uh, sleep disorders give you a five, four times higher chance to have a stroke, and three times higher chance of having heart disease, and twice the normal person of getting high blood pressure. These are factual stuff. Oh. It's, it's related, I think, if just to put it simply for the layperson to understand, 
when your airway is obstructed, you therefore have less oxygen circulating to the areas that need it. And the most important area that needs oxygen is your brain. And certainly for the, in the children, what is, happens with obstructive sleep apnea is actually a physical disruption, not only of the healing processes that sleep normally affords you, but to the actual content and structure of your brain, especially your frontal brain, your frontal cortex. Now that's very that's the part of your brain that allows you to be sensible and to uh, exhibit what we call executive functioning. Uh, we are, when we wonder why society and the world is full of such poorly executive functioning individuals, it may be related to their sleep. Executive functioning from the frontal cortex have, is, is responsible for decision making, impulse control, shifting ideas, um, delaying, um, gra delayed gratification, a lot of things that we, we often blame youngsters and blame on youth that we can see in adults in our society. And a lot of it can come back to disordered sleeping and the poor restorative functioning um, of poor sleep. So you actually see that, Dr. Bird, in your practice with children that you, you currently see? Because I, I would expect then this would affect their learning. Oh, certainly. And, and as you alluded to, their behavior. Um, uh, certainly. Um, we are doing a lot of investigation of children that have poor academic functioning in school in, in St. Lucia. We have a, a, a multidisciplinary team that looks into that. And we're only now, with this new interest in sleep, beginning to recognize the impacts of poor sleep on some of what we have been dealing with. These are children who have been diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. These are children that have poor impulse control. These are children that have to be sent to anger management and impulse control management. And a lot of it we're going to, I believe we're going to see, now that we're exploring this new area, is related to poor sleep and the effects of not having proper oxygenation and the sleep cycle that yeah. Dr. Suraj was speaking <clears throat> about. It has been well recognized that when you have low oxygenation of the brain, it does affect your cognitive function, your intellectual function, your judgment. How do you place things in, in, in terms of your decision-making process? And it is well established that these things uh, suffer when you have low oxygen because every time you have a sleep apnea and by definition apnea means cessation of breathing the breathing cuts off no air is passing up and down so whenever you have breathing uh, sleep apnea the oxygen that is normally present in your blood begin gradually to go down so it maybe if it starts at 99 percent oxygen it goes 98 97 94 93 92 and Sometimes. then your brain says, wake up, idiot. Yeah, and then about 80, <laughs> it tells you, wake ah, okay. up. Uh -huh. okay. And you yeah. wake up, you take a few gasps, and then you fall asleep again. And sometimes you may remember, sometimes you may not. But this is uh, the pattern. And more importantly, when the oxygen begins to go lower, it begins to cause all other problems. Like Indeed. the heart begins to behave funny. And it has been said that many people who die in their sleep may have done so because at low oxygen, the heart begins to you get, get an arrhythmia. arrhythmia. Yes, yeah. you so get you an irregularity. You can die in your sleep because that is of right. yeah. a very mm -hmm. extreme mm -hmm. sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. And oh depending yes. on what kind of, how dicey the heart is um, when you have these apneic spells. Does it depend on age? Is age related, is, is health related as well. And, and uh, it is, the genetics are not very strong on that, but generally it has to do with your other comorbidities or other medical conditions that you may have. Like everything else. You know? Let's take this moment to just have a look at a video with somebody um, yeah. it, it, in, in that state right now. It might be graphic to some of you, um, but it's something that we believe that we should have a look at to actually have um, an understanding of what the state is. We go to the video.
Wow, so that's what somebody who is in yeah. sleep apnea looks that's like. Right. So Dr. Siraj, can you just give us a little explanation of what exactly we were viewing yeah. just this moment? Yeah, sure. Uh, what you saw there was a patient who went through a sleep study, an overnight sleep study. You may or may not have seen that there were leads on the forehead, on the head to, me to monitor the brain activity. And a band around him? Yeah, before we get there, they were running on the eyes to look at eye movement. There's a little piezoelectric uh, sensor in the nose to monitor airflow. There is uh, one on the, just on the voice box to, man to monitor snoring. There are some ECG leads that you, for the heart testing rhythm. There are a few leads on the chest and the abdomen, two bands that uh, have sensors when they stretch to monitor how much effort you are actually making in order to try to breathe. And of course, there are others in the legs, etc., which does not show on that one. But essentially, what you saw there is somebody who was sleeping, and you can see that person has some weight. Yes, quite, quite yeah. some weight. Who was sleeping, and the breathing cuts off, and a, tr and a lot of abdominal movement, but very little airway, in, because you know, because there is no, you're not hearing the snoring. But of course, the monitor will pick up the airflow. And when the sat oxygen, so as soon as this happened, the oxygen you normally have in your body, 98%, will gradually go down. And at a certain stage, say 30, say, um, say 80%, you will find that the brain big, triggers waking up. And you wake up, take a few gas. Now, when you wake up, you may not be alert to show that you are woken up because you may not remember that. So you really, you cannot go by what the person actually remembers. Yeah. They may not even recognize that mm. their sleep has been disturbed 300 times yeah. during the night. And they might night. actually fall back into yes. another sleep again. Yes, yes. Yeah. it's a cycle. And the measure, uh, the, so this is a polysomnograph. And poly polysomnograph? Som polysomnograph. Poly means many, somno means sleeping, sleep. and a graph is uh, a tracing. So okay. polysomnograph is PSG, they call it. And that's what we offer you at you the actually Diagnostic Sleep Center. Yeah. Okay. Come and spend a night with us. It's a very comfortable night in an air-conditioned, very seductive environment. Uh, you may get put off a little bit by the wiring, but at it's first, not. But it's non-invasive. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, mm -hmm. it's non-invasive. It's not painful. It's the same wiring that is done for an electrocardiogram mm -hmm. when we do your heart testing, and there's no pain at all involved. And then you're relaxed on a comfortable bed by yourself in a private room, and you're invited to put yourself to sleep. So we encourage people to, you know, come along with their iPad or a good book and just settle down and sleep the way you think you sleep at home. And then we are recording you actively, so we will video, save you video from any recording? disorders. Yeah, video, um, there's a video yes. element to as, it. As well as the other... And the electronic yeah, yeah. Okay. Mo monitoring. The, the video one is to look at the position because sometimes if a lid falls off we can see it on the video yeah. apart from the tracing i'm also curious though what is the what, what are your clients the patient's reaction to seeing themselves or do no they never do, do they, they never they no, never the first of all patients not, relax not first but uh, are yes. they surprised at how they behave in terms of in that state well actually we do not the video is um it's not Sure, it's not uh, recorded. It just goes, um, it just goes ad hoc. So you just see the position, the movement, but you do not, we do not use the video as a tracing. So we don't have a live video going on. We, We're not capturing we you in your sleep. Yeah. So what we use yeah. the video for is to check the positioning and whether a lead falls off or, or whether you change position, etc. But we are monitoring about 24 different gadgets, different leads in all different parts of your body. We are monitoring that and to see the tracing as to how you behave. More importantly, for example, with him, you are looking at the depth of sleep. As soon as you fall, as soon as you close your eyes, we put off the light, then we monitor your wakefulness. At what point you fall asleep, and the sleeping has three stages, stage one, stage two, stage three, and how long you spend in each, and then rapid eye movement sleep, which is when you dream and when you benefit maximally from the sleep. 
and then after a cycle of about this entire cycle takes about 90 minutes and then you go back to stage one and then you go stage two stage three the REM sleep and so you go throughout the, throughout the night so this is really the best way to test and, and diagnose sleep orders. Um, you, you really mm -hmm. cannot do it like with a blood test or other no, 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 no. You really have to monitor the function of the brain, mm -hmm. the depth of sleep, and the movement of the muscles of sleep while you're sleeping. So I would expect that you would need to do some level of public awareness then, because um, mm -hmm. at least for me, in <clears throat> terms of what I would look for, you check your eyes, you check your blood pressure, you do your annual physical, but to do a polysomnograph is definitely something that wouldn't come on my radar. Yeah, um, yeah. What, what would you say um, to St. Lucian's in terms of really um, looking in this direction to possibly diagnose some behavioral um, issues, etc.? Well, that is why we're here, actually, and we just thank you for this opportunity. Uh, because we're really just emerging now with our public awareness to get St. Lucians and the wider OECS Caribbean especially uh, to recognize that this service is available and how important sleep is to the brain and the functions of all of your body's organs. Uh, the patients that we are seeing being referred initially are patients with severe disorders from physicians who have been aware that their patients have a problem, uh, but the service has not been available before. But we want to open the door wider to the average Joe and Jane to recognize that you can do a lot for yourself by improving the efficiency of your sleep. But you can't do that until you diagnose that you don't have efficient sleep. And so we're inviting people to come in and fill out the sleep questionnaire have a tour of the Diagnostic Sleep Center, and just become more aware of the functions of sleep and what happens when you don't sleep well. Thank you very much. We'll discuss a little more on that questionnaire as well as preventative measures when we come back. Thank you, stay tuned. I'm so fed up with my 13-year-old child. She's driving me crazy. I just don't know what to do. All that child need is some good licks to wake up. Alice, ignore the counseling pansies given. Government employees have free access to professional counseling services under the Employee Assistance Program known as EAP. EAP? EAP? What's that? Uh? Not me that telling people my business. Listen to me, Alice. I was struggling with my child. I made an appointment to see an EAP counselor and I was very satisfied with the service that I received. And you know what? Up to a day like today, my information remains confidential. Cox, how come nobody in the office knew anything about your counseling? Ah, that's because EAP counselors, they work on the strict clauses of confidentiality. I know you know what confidential means. Eh, hey, hey. EAP providing professional counseling services? How much is it? Girl, the counseling is free. Free for you, free for your child. And you know what? Your information remains confidential. Call the EAP unit at the Ministry of the Public Service. Telephone number 468-2269 for more information. EAP works. Let it work for you. Welcome back. We're still discussing sleep disorders with Dr. Jacqueline Bird and Dr. Leonard Siraj from the Diagnostic Sleep Center. Yeah. So we've now recognized some of the symptoms, how mm -hmm. dangerous it is. It, um, sleep disorders, sleep apnea can even cause death in, in certain instances. Um, how do I go about, I, I've decided now that I want to be treated. Um, deciding what can you walk us through the steps of mm. how you go about counseling people and treating them mm. before you get treated you have to be treatable okay <laughs> and how do uh, i know if i'm treatable uh, well that's what i'm getting into we there is a, a questionnaire that is put out by and it is accepted by the american academy for sleep studies sleep okay so there's studies. a standard there's a standard form way of going okay yeah and it is called uh, Apley's uh, 
um, ep sorry, ep of skill of sleep um, disturbances. Okay. Basically, it asks you to grade yourself based on your level of sleepiness for different regular activities. Regular activities mean sitting there watching TV or just reading a book or sitting in the back of a car that is driving or stopping by the, by the stop sign. And uh, after lunch or after a meal, uh, do you fall asleep? In a meeting, if you're conducting a meeting and you're a passive attendant to the meeting, are you falling asleep? The, so it goes through a few and it grades it between zero and a three. Three being really bad, zero means you're fine. Um, it also asks you to take into consideration if you have other comorbid situations like high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity. And the next circumference is a very good index of, where, of whether you really will have sleep apnea. And in men, anything above 17 is considered. Inches? In, yeah, 7 yes. inches. Mm -hmm. And uh, in women, 16 inches. Wow. Now, this, this, the questionnaire that Leonard is speaking about is administered when you come in for investing, for, you know, just to get information to the okay, sleep Okay, so center. I was just about to ask, is it yes. something I can go out online and administer You can to get myself? it online and you can get it at our sleep center. Uh, it's something that's available the ep, ep with um, sleep scoring. And uh, if you score, after you've scored yourself, that's to determine whether you are a candidate that may require a sleep study. And if you score at a certain level more than three, then you will be, a, you, the, the, the recommendation then is to proceed and do a sleep study. And there are two sets of sleep study you can do. Either a less intricate one where you take the material, the gadget home, and then you can do it at home. But well, you can do it at home. There's one well. you can do at home. Okay. And there's another one where you have to come to the lab because the things they're monitoring would have been more critical that you cannot be monitoring it on your own at home. When you say you can do it at home, what, what exactly is the equipment and like or, or the process it's like? It's like a headband. It it's a headband that has a few um, leads on it, and it, 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 it measures your forehead blood flow. It measures and there's a little thing that goes your on your finger. It measures the oxygen. So it, it does some basic... It's uh, a screen. It's essentially a screen that highlights and flags you as a candidate for the proper overnight sleep mm -hmm. study. And if it is a mm -hmm. limited number of things you're looking for, then you can get by with that, that uh, the home sleep study. In this day and age, I'm wondering if there is an app for that. Nowadays, you have various smart watches that mm -hmm. can trace everything while you exercise, maybe even while you sleep. Yeah, this is actually like that. Yeah, yes. this was designed like that, uh, as an app for that kind of thing. And, and uh, the, the person self puts it just before they go yeah, to we sleep? Would, we would, you come in the lab, we would tell you how to put it on. It's a, it's a disposable one, so after we use it, okay. you can't use it for a second person. Okay, so would coming out of that home test um mm -hmm. there be indication to do a deeper a deeper test then? yeah if yes. it is showing that there are parameters that have been measured that is of concern to us whereby we want to monitor you in a much more elaborate setup and and, uh, and observe you while you are sleeping then we would need to to recommend the, the sleep but yep. most people would prefer just to to do the sleep test, the, the in-hospital sleep one, one, because you know you can get all the information you require. Okay. In terms of preventative measures, as we always talk about, what can you do um, to the best of your ability, unless you are just susceptible to that, either through family history or other causes, but what, what can you do to minimize your risk of sleep apnea, sleep disorders? Um, there are some uh, things that you are born with. If you are born with a partition of your nose that is bent, you've got to straighten that out. If you have large tonsils and adenoids, you've got to straighten that out. Mm -hmm. If you have any other medical conditions, you better straighten that out. Um, or surgical thing. And uh, if the, the, the real challenge sometimes is when you have people with a short chin, that a lot of um, work has been done on that to find the best answer for that. It still remains a challenge. 
However, these conditions I mentioned so far are things that are beyond your control. You just happen to, yes. to be that but, way. But they're things that are under your control, control and yeah. their lifestyle changes that directly impact sleep optim up for the better. Such as? Weight loss, mm -hmm. healthy diet, reduction in your amount of alcohol and smoking, mm -hmm. and of course exercise. Mm -hmm. Nothing improves sleep like efficient exercise. Uh, and we recommend that a lot for children uh, to improve their sleep patterns as well. Get your children outdoors and moving. Get your children not to be overweight. Get your children um, on a healthy diet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's again look at some of the problems associated with um, those sleep orders. Mm -hmm. um, some of them in terms of hypertension, obesity, mm -hmm. Um, Everything that can go wrong mentioned. with you yeah. medically mm -hmm. uh, can be worsened by poor sleep. Yeah. So we're talking about all the metabolic conditions like diabetes, hypertension, uh, stroke, cardiac disease. Uh, it can, is, is worsened by poor sleep through the mechanism of the cardiac arrhythmias. Uh, mental function, um, mm -hmm. intellectual function, cognitive functioning in children academic performance in schools, attention, um, all of these things are, are, are negatively impacted by poor sleep. Mm -hmm. So the answer to it is you must sleep well to live well. Okay. Where do you see the sleep center going from here now? Very good question. Not because I know the answer, but um, it is still a good question. And that is, of course, it is... Uh, with the sleep uh, technology comes a lot of other things that can happen. And that is investigation for other neurological conditions like epilepsy, like um, dizziness, like uh, brain tumors. All these can be, because uh, the guy who did the, the conduct the training with us told us that our setup is good enough for us to expand tremendously on it, and he think that we should do that as a matter of urgency. When you say expansion, um, do you also see clients from around the region, the sub-region? Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, we see, we see, yeah. we see yes, people. Um, yes, we're the only coming. we're the only sleep center in this in the OECS. Trinidad is our nearest neighbor that has an established uh, mm. sleep center. But I both, think both Barbados Trinidad and Barbados, and Barbados yeah. have sleep centers. But they are like standalone. What a guy was telling us from the state. He said that our unit attached to a hospital with the affiliation of specialists that we have, we have a tremendous, we have a far better arrangement than most places because we, the, most of the other places are standalone. One person decided to do a sleep study, but we are attached to a hospital with all the, the importance of that. One of the most positive spin-offs that we see for the future is the ability to track people with seizures, to investigate persons with epilepsy and other forms of abnormal movement disorders. Because the recording during the overnight sleep study also picks up abnormal brainwave activity or seizures. We don't have that service available in St. Lucia at the moment to diagnose epilepsy uh, and this, our sleep study will be able to assist patients in this regard, even if they don't have a sleep disorder. How do I find you? How do we find you? How do you find treatment? We're easy to find. Uh, We're at Tapion Hospital. It's not within the hospital itself. It's, it's, it's an adjacent the building in, uh, in the car park. So if people have a negative feeling about being admitted to hospital, you're not being admitted to hospital. The sleep center is a standalone center. And it's, it's very calming and very um, attractive. Uh, you can call 459-2216 or 459-2034 and just ask for information, ask for a tour, and, um, and speak to one of the specialists. And uh, we also have, uh, we are affiliated with isdsleepcenter.com, sleeptest.com. And this uh, website actually has the, 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 questionnaire. the questionnaire you can download from mm -hmm. there. And the, the, the website will direct the, those who are coming from St. Lucia to us. 
So we will get we can get a feedback from that. Well, thank you very much, um, Dr. Bird and Dr. Siraj, on joining us to discuss um, sleep disorders, sleep apnea, and um, ways of getting treatment. Definitely, it's heartening to hear that we at least have a way to address this. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, that as you compile your statistics and your findings, you will come back to share it with us. Um, we wish you all the best in your endeavor. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for this opportunity. And thanks, GIS, for allowing us to share our experiences with them and so forth. You're most welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us in this discussion again. And we ask that you stay tuned with us as we bring you more information for your insight and edification. Thank you. And until next time, I'm Richmond C. Felix saying goodbye.